and welcome back. Now let's try to figure out the solution to the problem we posed last lecture, which was how do we make use of this incredible, incredibly powerful machine, 2021? We know how to deal with the wide vectors, but I've got multiple cores. How do I think about from a software point of view to be able to make this machine scream, make this machine do all the, you know, all, all the performance, all the compute on some huge data set? How do I make use of multiple cores attacking at the same time? Let's get started. So I ran, I go to my Unix machine, I type PS minus X. Please try, find the equivalent, you know, the equivalent command on your computer. Usually it's PS with some kind of command. It used to be dash EF, now it's X. Here's what I see. I've got 156 different programs running at the same time right now. And that, and, I mean, not right now, but at, that, at the time of that, of that slide, uh, 156. How does my laptop do that? How does my laptop somehow, my fan's not running, it's quiet. How is it running 156 programs all at the same time happily? The fan isn't even going. You know, the over, oh my gosh, I'm being overheated. The fan, it's not, listen, there's a microphone. No fan, very quiet, happy. How does it do this? How does it, how are you imagine, and this is the analogy, imagine doing 156 different assignments at the same time. It's crazy. So, here's the idea. First, first new name, new name for this lecture, a thread. A thread stands for a thread of execution. It is a single stream of instructions. Think of a, you know, old school program, a single PC. You load in a program, A dot out, and you load it and you're running it. Okay, you're living it out. Just think about that for a moment. Okay, and you don't ever, you know, it, there's there's some com control. There's some control which is being you make a function call. Now it goes here, then it comes back, and it comes back here. It's a single thread of execution. Okay, that's a thread. A program within it out could split or fork itself to have multiple threads of execution all running at the same time, and then it might have a way to join them back together to have a result. So these are kind of analogies here. So it's an easy way to think about parallelism as a single thread of execution. I'm just kind of following. It's, it's like a finger, single finger. I'm saying, I'm on this line. Now I'm on this line. Now I make a function call. Now I return. It's single finger, single thread of execution. Okay. Imagine I have old school days. I've got a, a single CPU and a single core. How do I handle multiple threads? How did your computer in the, day, in the days uh, long gone that had a single core and had a had and had didn't and a single single CPU and a single core. How was it able to run multiple programs? The OS is a program. How was it able to run the OS and anything else? Well, here's how it always did it: time sharing. The idea is, the single CPU, single core can essentially. By the way, I, I make this analogy before I make this analogy again. If you if you're a parent with multiple kids, and if you have more kids than parents, or if you're somehow your spouse leaves and you're in charge of all the kids and you have more than one. You have to give a lot of love to more than, than just a one-on-one. One-on-one defense doesn't work anymore. You just play zone defense. As, as parents, a lot of kids talk about it. So what does that mean? You give a little, you can put one, you put the youngest to bed, and then you hang out with the middle one, and you put that to bed, give some kisses. Then you put the older one, give that to bed. Then you keep going. You give a little love to every single one. Okay, so it's a little like a little slice, slice of time for each particular one. Each one thinks, oh, you're giving all the love to me. And then they go around, they read a book or something. They don't realize that you're actually giving love to other people at the same time. That's what the CPU is doing. CPU says, let me go to the first thread and give it a little bit of time. A little bit of time, it's running, it's processing something. And then put it like, pause it. Go to the next one. And, and by the way, it's not unlike the analogy of, of having children where they go off and read a book, it's not doing anything. When you're not giving attention to it, it's not doing anything because you're the only one who can actually make, you know, make it compute. So you go to the next one, give a little love. The next one, give a little, and you keep rotating. And then you go back to the first one. And if you do this fast enough, if you time share fast enough, slice through time fast enough, you will never notice it. It'll just seem like your computer's a little, and the more you have, the less slice you get, but you're like, oh, my computer's a little slower, and now my video's maybe dropping frames or something, or, or maybe Zoom isn't doing the right thing if you have a really overworked machine. Maybe it's not able to, to the YouTube sometimes can give you a very high, well, this might be also transfer of data, but sometimes even the processing of data can't, um, not once they drop pixels, but it can't have the highest resolution. Oh, I'm, I need to lower my resolution on YouTube, not because the pipe isn't big enough in the terms of data, but I just don't have time, the compute time to take all that in and do this. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm failing right now. I'm going to now pinch down the pipe and say, give me a smaller, it might actually do this. You might have a system that's, that says, I have a big enough pipe to handle a 1080p or a 4K stream or an 8K stream, but not enough CPU cycles. So I'm going to pinch it down. Just give me 360 or 720 or something smaller than that, you know, to be able to handle that. Hey, time sharing, slice it through, okay, if you have a single thread. 
Single CPU, multiple threads, you time share between them. And by the way, I'll give you a little, two, a little 30 second story. When I was uh, an undergraduate, we worked on a time sharing system. Um, it was called Multics uh, back, at, back, back at MIT. And we had a system where I would, we would all, uh, the week before finals, we'd all be writing our papers. So I, was, I, was, I went to the lab, the computer lab, to write my paper, paper, paper. Didn't have a laptop, didn't have a laptop or a personal computer at the time. And I was in my freshman year. And I'm writing a paper and the slice of time that I got was so small, okay, with all the M MIT other undergraduates doing it, I would type a whole line of characters and not see my cursor update. Imagine a computer so slow, it doesn't even update the cursor. Imagine, right? And then, I remember this, I remember being so frustrated because it would then give me, I would say, it would go and give me, it'd give me a little slice, it would type all of them and I have a typo. Then I realized, oh my gosh, I have to like, I would count how many characters to go back, I would I'd go, go back 60, change an A to an E, and, and I wouldn't update, but my cursor wouldn't even update. Okay, imagine this world where time sharing was so stretched thin, in terms of resources, it couldn't even update the screen in a text editor. That's what it was. Writing a paper in this was incredibly painful. We all learned to work in the middle of the night to do this because during, you know, during a five o'clock, six o'clock, middle of the afternoon, you couldn't even type 80 characters without having it paused until it'd give the whole line. Okay, so time sharing can go bad if you have too many, too many things asking for work for, for one CPU. Too many kids, if I had 100 kids, each kid would be like, ah, all crying at the same time, we'd, we'd be bad. Um, so, in threads, more detail. Threads are a sequential flow of instructions that perform some task. And we've been calling this a program for now, but now we're gonna know that we're called, it's really called a thread. A lot of times we, we start with an abstraction, we kind of reveal the abstraction later. It's really not, you know, it's really called a virtual address space, not, not, not just an address space. So we're doing the same thing here with, with the, a program. Program was a program, now a program, really we're talking about a thread for now. Each thread has a dedicated program counter that knows for that thread what you're doing. Separate registers, ooh, interesting. So now you're thinking, how's that different from a pro Okay, well, separate registers. You can still access the shared memory. We saw that before. Each physical, now we have to talk about, here. this is actually important, the distinction between a hardware thread and a software thread, okay. Each physical core, so each core, the element is a core, that's the unit now, provides one or more hardware threads. So a hardware thread is a thread running on that core. Okay, so each is executing a hardware thread. So when the thread is kind of loaded in a way onto the core, it's a hardware thread now. The operating system supports and can multiplex between multiple software threads. And the idea is I might have a program that divides itself into a hundred different threads. Those would be software threads, but I only have a four core machine. So now what does that tell me? Only four of those 100 software threads can be hardware threads. If it's running on a core live, it's kind of loaded, then it's mapping it onto that hardware thread, that, that's mapped into that core, it becomes a hardware thread. 100 software threads, four hardware threads on a four core machine. I might be able to actually be clever to get more hardware threads running on these four cores, but for now, we don't know anything about that, so we're gonna say only four for a four core machine, I only have four hardware threads. Okay, and by the way, if you're still a software thread and haven't been mapped to a hardware thread, you're waiting, because because nobody can process you. Just like the kid can't read, if you're not being actively processed by a, into a hardware thread, if you're a software thread just sitting there, you're not processing. You're just idle. You're, you're waiting. Okay, that's the idea. Hardware threads are running on the on the cores. Software threads are all the ones that you created. All the ones that are kind of there and waiting. All the ones in the total space are all software threads. The ones running on cores are hardware threads. Okay, just some some some, some nomenclature. This is Professor Edward Lee, recently emeritus, I believe. He had this wonderful quote about threads. Um, I'll just read it to you. you Normally I don't read slides, but it's just too good. Although threads seem to be a small step from sequential computation, in fact, they represent a huge step. They discard the most essential and appealing properties of sequential computation. Understandability, you just, you know, process, now you get, I get it, you can have code that's hard to read, but in general, understandability, predictability, and determinism. Threads, as a model of computation, are wildly non-deterministic. It means kind of random in a way. And the job of the programmer becomes one of pruning that non-determinism. Determinism means that I can basically promise you what the output would be. There is no, there's no, I'm not rolling a dice in it, I'm not, I'm not shuffling anything, there's no randomness there. 
Non-determinism means I often don't know the order that these threads are going to, these threads get out there and what order they come back, I don't know. And that's the hard part about programming with threads is how do you manage all these threads taking different amounts of time. One thread went over there and just got spun in a loop and maybe it's going to come back in a year, maybe never come back. So who knows, right? How many, who knows what my program does? Managing all, and a program, a single threaded program could do that too, but not if I send all, it's like send all the, I hire all these workers, go out and do some stuff, and go out like, I pay all these bees, go do something, and then some of them haven't come back, some of them have, some come back in different orders. What do I do? How do I manage that? Is what Ed was talking about. So here's the idea the abstraction is they're all simultaneously active. Remember, I can rotate the time sharing, lets them all rotate. So I've got even, so from the point of view of software, in a way, I don't care how many hardware threads can ever be run. I'm just gonna say, well, you know what? It makes sense to break this up into 100 pieces just because that's the way logically this problem breaks up. So I break it up into 100 pieces and let them all go. And you're gonna notice that if there actually are only four hardware threads possible, that maybe 100, I'll say it this way. It might be faster to break, if there are only four hardware threads and I have a problem, to break it up into more than four software threads. And you're gonna say, why? Why, why, would that, why, why? why do this? Here's why. Let's say one part of it gets stalled. So one of those hardware threads just gets stalled, okay? So one quarter of your whole thing is just being idle, stalled, because some, some part of the code is there and it's needed to do extra th work. Who knows? It's just stalled. Now it's gonna eventually return, but it's just stalled. Imagine if, however, broke them to 100 of these guys, okay? And 26, number 26, this is the one that's gonna stall. Like out of the 100 pieces, there's one thing that's a particularly hard computation, let's just say. So when that comes in, it's going here, and imagine if it's 100 now. Let's go back to this model. If only one of those 100, or if it's only four, one of those four is gonna be stalled and kind of take a long time. If I break into 100 pieces, then basically I can compute all 99 of them. Like let's say it's a lot of work. So all 99 of them can finish, and that one guy is still solved, still, okay, still, still computing, still, okay, finally it re returns. In the four model, I, these three finished, and then this is still waiting for that first one. That first stalled guy is still stuck, still stuck, and stuff. Okay, now it finishes, and then still has 25 more to do. But if I broke into 100, it's like those other 24 things that are now waiting because the first guy got stuck, can be processed over here if I break it into 100 pieces. Only that one guy that gets stuck was stalled there. So you could actually imagine that it makes sense for a particular problem to divide up into more software threads than you have hardware threads. That's what I'm saying. It could just be that. And I don't think I've described that very well, but the idea is you're just stalling with yourself and the other 25, 24% of the problem. But in the other, in my world, these guys are computing all those guys and you're stuck on one hundredth of the problem. And then when that gets done, you're done, rather than have to then compute the other 24 undone guys. That's what I'm trying to say. And it, who knows what's happening in that particular problem, but it could make sense to, and there's a knob, there's a knob, I have a problem. How, how much do I slice this up into for the given amount of hardware threads I can run it on, the given amount of cores I have, the given amount of machines I'm dispatches to on the cloud, how, much resolution, how small a slice should I do? And so you play with this curve and you play with it and you see what the, what the knee and the curve is, what the low point of the curve is in terms of time, okay? So point number one, you get this abstraction of software threads, okay? You're gonna multiplex software threads onto hardware threads, right? The idea that you're, there are, here's the pool and now you're gonna grab some of them and pull them in here, pull them in, pull them in, work, okay, pull it out, put another one in, you're gonna try to get them all to be, to be, to be macked in there. Um, you could, how do you do that? How do you bring them in and out? Well. You could decide whenever you've got a, a block thread, you got a cache miss, user input, network access. There's some reason that thread is stalled for whatever reason, as we call that blocked. It could be a lot of those things, right? Cache miss, I've got to go to Sacramento. It's a thousand cycles. Well, get that guy out of here while you're going to Sacramento, make that kind of a request that goes out there, pull it out, and then bring somebody else in to get some work done while the Sacramento return it. And maybe it's even farther than Sacramento. Maybe now you don't have a virtual memory, and maybe I need to go to disk. Maybe it means a page miss. Oh my gosh, how many is that, a million? clock cycles for a page miss possibly. So get this guy out while it's waiting on it, while that's happening, do other work, okay? You could also have a timer, like a little time slice. So you say, well, okay, they're all fine. No cache misses. Let's say I'm all doing, you know, just adds and R type instructions, adds and subtracts and XORs. It's just simple stuff. Not even any memory access. Just, just I'm computing. I'm like raw compute mode. Well, 
give some other give give some other people a chance. Give some love to other people. So let some other people. So maybe slice out after a couple of timers. So you can multiplex them in different ways. How do you remove it? How do you remove a software thread from a hardware thread? Um, so it's, it's here we go. How do I take it out? How do I unplug it and put it back in the kind of waiting stage? Well, I have to interrupt its execution. I got to stop running. I need to save its state. I got to save its state. So we did this. We did this. We learned a little bit in virtual memory how you move things around uh, for multiple processes. So you have to save its register, save its PC to memory. You got to pull it out, save it to memory, and now you've got it. Okay, so that's important. Um, so I can reinstate it. So now all the things that are part of that part of that world of computation have to be have to be saved, and that's obviously the registers in the PC. How do you do the same thing? How do you start a different software thread? How do you load that onto a hardware thread? Well, you go go to memory, and grab grab its previously saved registers until the hardware's registers, and you jump to its PC and you keep going. So basically, registers and PC is the piece that's needed for these, these guys. Pull it out, pull it in. Pull it out, pull it in. And you're doing this for removing and adding different software threads. So here's an example, very simple. Here I got a thread pool. Here's my pool of threads. Here's the list over here of a couple of, of all the processes, all the threads that need to be, to be running. And the OS is going to map those threads to the cores. So that's the idea. And you're going to schedule that to make that happen. I've got four cores. Each core is actively running one instruction stream at a time. And that's it. So I've got this huge pool, and they're being mapped to the four hardware threads. If here I have only one hardware thread per core, and I'm running on that. And I'm just kind of doing this until, until the program finishes. Or, and by the way, you're seeing here, many of these are daemons. Many of these are programs that just continue to run. If the, if the name ends in a D, as a, the list here, you know, user S, even user node D, the D means daemon. It means it's running all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't stop. It's not like, well, shoot, that was hard. We're all done. Are we done yet? No. Some of the programs never stop. And so the, the computer's always just processing. Your computer idle, even a you know even a computer that's running anything like I'm just in the, in the Mac in the Finder I'm just in the OS doing nothing I'm not running any programs nothing's running but what yes things are running it's listening for a hardware connections it's somebody's running to be able to handle the, the keyboard that's your OS uh, are there some network things there are many things that are happening in the background Who, who's updating the clock all those things are running even though you don't realize it as part of the OS so even if you're running no user programs many things are running in your in your system network you should check that out by the way do you have type ps minus minus x and you'll see the list of all the things running, even when you're running nothing else, or maybe just run terminal and then type that. You'll see, wait, I'm only running terminal, and there's a ton of things being run at the same time. Okay, all those are being processed. All that is complicated, but the nice thing is the OS handles it for you. So far, I haven't talked about at all explicitly loading this thing in. We even talked about how to even split and fork and join, fork myself and join it back. We haven't done any of that, so we're just talking about the big picture, kind of what the OS. And mostly, we're talking about what the OS has been doing all along, and that's what's happening. All right. We're going to see how to make this work. We're getting lower and lower in the abstraction level of being able to do this ourselves, explicitly you know, touching some code that actually splits this stuff and joins it up in a couple lectures. All right, we'll see you there.